simple systems work, but also very uh, high level theoretical work as well. Um, and so, so hopefully, even though this class is a lot more about the low level work, um, that lecture kind of gives you a little bit of a, a taste of what some of the theoretical parts of uh, parallel computer science are. So uh, we'll put the references that you have uh, linked to on the webpage, so you can look at that if you're interested in more, more algorithms. Um, okay, so so today, um, uh, yeah, I know it's a long day. We'll have three lectures. Um, I'm going to talk about something completely different, um, and it's often something that a lot of students are very interested in. You hear a lot about GPUs, 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 uh, and I'm going to talk a little bit today about how GPUs work, and I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, how to program those GPUs. So since we don't have too much time in this session. Hopefully, in the very beginning, what I can tell you is I want to tell you why GPUs exist at all. Um, because we have CPUs, and now all of a sudden everybody's talking about GPUs uh, for deep learning, for computer vision, for big scientific computation. But, but these GPUs were not designed to do deep learning. They were not designed to do computer vision. They were designed to render 3D graphics. They were designed so that you could play StarCraft, or you could play Quake, or you could play games. So I'm going to talk a little bit about why they were designed that way. And then we can come, up, come back and say, hey, these things that are designed to play Quake and StarCraft are also very useful to do deep learning and computer vision. Okay? So, and the other thing that I want you to think about is even though in this class we've been talking about CPU, 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 and all these CPU ideas, I want you to keep in mind that when we go to the GPU, everything that you have learned is about the same. The numbers are just a little bit different. So a GPU is still a multi-core processor. A GPU is still a SIMD processor. And a GPU is still a multi-threaded processor. All three of those things still exist, except it's going to be many more cores, much wider SIMD, and many more threads. So to get started, I'm going to talk a, lot, a little bit. If this was a graphics class, this is what a lecture I would give you. So GPUs were built to render pictures. Everybody that is looking at their laptop right now, maybe some of you are playing games and not even watching the lecture, there is a GPU in your computer that's rendering the pictures on the screen. And if you took a graphics class, I would tell you that, well, what's the problem? The problem is to take some description of the world, so surfaces, materials, lights. Like in this room, there are different materials with different colors. There are surfaces, and there are lights. There are lights up there, there's light coming in from the sun. And the graphics, a renderer, takes that description of the triangle, the surfaces, and the lights, and the materials, and it simulates what a camera would have seen from some position in the room. So if this is my model, this is the output, it's a very, very pretty picture. And these days, GPUs can render very, very pretty pictures. So here's an example of something that renders in real time. If you have a very high-end NVIDIA GPU, this is a picture that we could run at 30 frames per second. Um, here are other pictures that we can run at 30 frames per second. We can do very, very realistic simulation of what the world looks like. Um, and so this is work that, so you heard this earlier today about some of the work that Jan thinks about a whole lot. Um, this is some of the work that Jan thinks about a whole lot in his research. So he can tell you everything you might want to know about how this picture is made. So in this class, you'll see that many times the first thing we'll talk about is what's the algorithm. What are the dependencies? And then we'll think about how to schedule that algorithm onto the machine. Or we'll talk about how a programming language makes it easy to write that algorithm. So let me start by describing the 3D graphics algorithm. Because I'll assume nobody here is taking graphics. None of my students in this class at CMU have taken graphics either. But I think I can explain to you how a picture is made without anybody knowing graphics. 
And this is a good example of I like to teach some things that are not technical things. It can be very useful to be able to be good at describing how systems work. And so I want to point out how I'm going to describe how this system works in a very simple terms. And so whenever I describe a new algorithm or a new system, I start with nouns. I start with what are the things that we are computing. So up until now, it's usually I have an array of numbers. And then I say what the out input is, I say what the output is. So in 3D graphics, the things are actually pretty simple. There's only four types of things. There are really only three types of things. There are triangles that represent surfaces. So I'm going to represent surfaces by triangles. And to represent those triangles, I'm going to tell you where the corners are. So I'll call these vertices. So a vertex would be a point in space, x, y, z, x, y, z, x, y, z. So one thing I have are vertices. The next thing I have is, well, I have to put those vertices together to make a surface. For example, a triangle or a square. So I have vertices. And I have primitives. So if I said we had 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, and I connect them together, I now have a surface. I have a triangle. OK. So once I have a triangle, and we have to draw it on a screen, there's the question of, well, what pixels on the image are covered by that triangle? So if I, you can kind of slow them up from far, but if you got up close, you can see the pixels on this projector. And then some of those pixels are going to get covered by the triangle. So we have points. We connect points to make primitives, or triangles, or surfaces. Those triangles cover some pieces of the screen. And in 3D graphics, we call those fragments which you can think of fragment as a little piece of something. And once I have pieces of things, I might compute the color of the triangle at that point. And that's all 3D graphics is. <laughs> is I have points, I have shapes, I have pieces of shapes, and then I compute the color of the shape at every one of those points, every one of those pieces. That is what a GPU does when you are playing Quake for Starcraft. So if those are the things, the last piece I have to tell you is what are the operations to create those things or compute their values. And so rendering a picture in, gra in graphics is actually pretty easy. So let's start with a list of points. <coughs> And I'm going to group the points into triangles. So this is a triangle with point vertex V0. Oh, sorry, this is a triangle. So one point is XYZ. Another point, XYZ. Ooh, problem. XYZ. XYZ. Third point, XYZ. Fourth point, XYZ. The first three make a triangle, <clears throat> maybe the next three would make a triangle, and so on, and so on. Okay. So what I'm drawing here on the right is I'm going to draw the sequence of dependencies for all of these computations. So if I give the GPU a list of vertices, that is sort of the first stage, that's the input. And the first thing the GPU does is it says, well, if this is x, y, z in 3D, where does that position fall in 2D if I project it to the screen? So if this is x, y, z in 3D, and I say my camera is right here, like right here, my camera is right here, and I take a picture, I show you the picture. Now every vertex 
is in 2D. It is at some position in 2D. It's been projected. So the first computation is I have to do that math. I have to take 3D plus camera position. And for every vertex in this buffer, I compute the 2D vertex position. Then it's very easy. Then I group into triangles. <clears throat> so now I have triangles on screen. And then I have to compute, so now I have triangles, a list of triangles. And for every triangle, I now need to compute what pixels are covered by the triangle. And if you took my graphics class, I would tell you how to, how to compute every pixel covered by the triangle. But in this class, you do not need to know how to compute every pixel. You just need to know that if I give you a triangle, I have a box which now produces a list of pixels covered by the triangle. And for every one of those pixels, I can compute what color that surface is at that point. And if this was a graphics class, I would tell you algorithms for simulating how light bounces off surfaces to uh, compute the color. But in this class, you don't need to know that. You just need to know that there's some algorithm run on every input pixel to compute a color for every output pixel. And that's basically it. Then I just have to put those pixels on the screen and I'm done. So this, if I ignore this, this right side is the list of operations that the system performs. I hand the GPU a list of vertices. It performs all of these operations, creating more lists, lists of triangles, lists of fragments of pixels, lists of colored pixels. And that's how the whole system runs. And it's a pipeline. So often we call this the graphics pipeline. Now, if this, the really hard part is if I give you a list of pixels, you need to compute the color. So this, cha this, this table is yellow because it is lit up by light, it is wood, it is shiny, and I'm looking at it from over here. And it's very complex to compute what a pixel actually looks like. And if you just look around this room, there's wood, there's metal, there's plastic, there's different paint colors. There is a huge number of different materials in the world. And so what the, grab, the GPU, what NVIDIA and AMD and Intel figured out is that there was, it was not possible for them to give you a library which just said, I want something that's this much shiny and this much this color and so on and so on. They said that for people to compute all the complicated materials in the world, very uh, speckly shoes or skin or very shiny metal or very accurate cloth, there is no way that we can just say, set these five parameters, and, and, and there's one algorithm for all of these things. <clears throat> they said that the only way is if applicate graphics developers could write a program to compute what the color of the material was. So that's why in this pipeline, this place, computing the color of a pixel, as actually as well as computing the position of a vertex. Those are just programs. So you will write a program that simulates your favorite material and you will give it to the GPU. So I'll give you one example of the program. So the syntax doesn't matter. This is actually called OpenGL Shading Language, which is a popular shading language for graphics. What does matter is that you write a function now the function is a little weird in that the input arguments are here. Varying means there is a, pro, a, a, a p input data per pixel. But this function gets run for every single pixel covered by the triangle. It executes some logic and it outputs a color. So this is very similar to the data parallelism that we talked about in this class, right? 
for every pixel with different values, compute an output. So the input is an array, the output is an array. And it turns out that if I execute this function on every pixel on the screen with different surface parameters, different surface directions, and so on and so on, the output of this function, which is a uh, RGB value, or RGB alpha value, is the color of every single one of these pixels. So the, the, the function that I wrote oops, sort of takes this image, this texture map, and it wraps it onto the surface. And you see that by the output here. Okay. So what's important is that why do GPUs have so many cores and so much SIMI is to execute exactly this function, these kind of functions on every single vertex, every single point, or on every single kind of pixel. That's how we render pictures. So about 15 years ago, right when CPUs were not getting very much faster, and why were they not getting very much faster? Hard to make the clock frequency go higher. No more ILP to automatically find. And so this is when the CPU, the CPU people were thinking, uh oh, big problem. But the GPU people were just keeping adding cores. Because all they had to do was execute these little functions on every pixel. And they knew if they just added cores, things would get faster and faster and faster. So a couple of, of people at Stanford and at, at the University of North Carolina, I'll come back to it in a second. What they said is, wait a minute. These GPUs have more and more cores. Let's use them to write parallel programs, not graphics programs. And I'll come back to that in five minutes. And we'll talk about how cool it should be. So they were hacking the GPUs. So then the folks at Stanford, and it was a, it was a, you know, a senior a student at Stanford when I first got there as a PhD student. He was very senior. He said, this is very stupid. I know about data parallel programming. How about we just make a data parallel program that where like the function scale gets run on all elements of the input array? that just compiles to OpenGL. So this, the compiler, would take your program and compile it to a graphics program that generated two triangles, and so on and so on. It was, it was kind of, it was, it was a little silly. 
But they were actually quite successful. They showed that using this programming language, you can do some interesting things. I think that they did protein folding, and then they did some other uh, uh, blocks like linear algebra on the GPU, and showed it was faster than the CPU because the GPU had all of these processors, all of these cores. So that research was enough to make a video go, ah, you, you, this, is, this is correct. Why don't we make it easier to program GPUs, which previously were programmed only with, here are the triangles, go render them, like normal data parallel processes. So NVIDIA said, we will have a way of programming our chips that makes them seem much more like regular CPUs. And that's where we get how we are today. So if we had a CPU, if you wanted to run a program on a CPU, let's think about what the system will do. The operating system would load the program into memory. It would stop the processor. It would select a core, or it would select an execution context to run the code on. It would set all the registers, the program counter, set up the execution context, and then say, go. That's how you run code on a CPU. The operating system does that. You say, you, know, you double click an icon to run a program. The operating system selects an execution context, loads your program, sets up the registers, sets up the first instruction pointer, and then tells the processor, OK, start running. If you had to run code on a GPU back in the old days, the only thing you could do is say, here are the triangles. Here is my program to compute the color. Go. There was no such thing as writing a program that did anything else. It was only that. So in 2007, NVIDIA said, we are going to make it simpler to write programs that are not graphics programs. For GPU. And it's as simple almost as SPMD programming. It's very much like ISPC, except ISPC came second after this. So now it's, I'm going to write a little program, and I'm going to tell the GPU how many times it should run. And that's it. So I'm going to say, run this program n times. Run n instances of this program. And I do that using a programming language called CUDA. Um, CUDA stands for something, I cannot remember what it stands for. I think it stands for Compute Unified Device Architecture, but it means nothing important. Um, so CUDA is a very simple programming language that is similar to ISPC that compiles to GPUs rather than CPUs. And you may have heard of OpenCL, OpenCL is the exact same thing as CUDA, it's just the open version of CUDA. So CUDA only runs on NVIDIA GPUs, OpenCL runs on G all GPUs and CPUs. CUDA is much easier to explain and use, so I will teach CUDA. But everything you learn here will be the same as OpenCL. Uh, open okay, so things to think about during this lecture. Do you think CUDA is data parallel? or thread parallel, or SPMD. I'd like you to think about that a little bit as I'm talking. Um, and uh, yeah, OK. So just like with ISPC, when I talk about CUDA, I'm going to use the words that CUDA likes to use. So CUDA has the word thread, talks about the term thread. So I will say CUDA thread to mean something. And I will be very clear how a CUDA thread is very different than a CPU thread. Okay? But I will use the term CUDA thread because that's what CUDA calls it. Okay. So let's go back to ISPC because you all know ISPC at this point. And remember in ISPC, sorry this is too light, um, we have one function here. This function is a sequential piece of code. It's a single program. In this case, the program um, runs uh, Saxby a times x plus y. This is program 5 from the assignment. 
and it runs, this program runs it on every program count element of the array. So it's a sequential program that runs on every program count element. But when I call the program, when I call the function, this is an SPMD function. So when I call it, I call it to create program count instances. And when all of those instances run, because of how I wrote the code, all of the elements in the array get processed. So call one, you know, run one function, run it program count times. We're going to do the exact same thing now in CUDA. So now this is going to be CUDA code, proper CUDA code. Okay. So now I have a CUDA program, and my function is going to be called matrix add. So the example that I'm going to use here is I have matrix A, matrix B, and I'm going to add all of the elements of A with all of the elements of B. So input matrix A, input matrix B, output matrix C. And the CUDA add function says, well, if you ignore all of this, this is there, it makes a lot of sense. CIJ equals BIJ plus AIJ plus BIJ. But in ISPC, you had program index and program count. And in CUDA, you now have not just one number, but you have a little bit more complicated way to identify to your thread ID is a little bit more complicated. So first of all, the thread ID can be a 2D number. And that's not very important, but sometimes that can be useful in graphics. Like if you're doing image processing, being able to say my thread ID is 1, 2 can be a little useful. So one, end, one thing is that the thread IDs in this example are 2D. So that's why you see thread index X instead of program instance, and thread index Y instead of program instance. So it's not that important. It's just a 2D thread ID. And then the last thing is that CUDA organizes its threads. So instead of saying, I want N threads, you say, I want n blocks of threads. And each block has a certain number of threads. So in this case, I said I wanted 1, 2, 3, 4 times 1, 2, 3, 12 blocks. Each block has six threads. And that will become a little bit more. So in this example, I'm processing matrices that are 12 by 6. Matrix is 12 by 6. And I decided to make 4 by 3 threads per block. So 12 threads per block. Uh, and so if there's 12 threads per block, 72, uh, 72 total elements in the matrix. This is why I created 6 blocks. So num blocks equals nx divided by threads per block x and size of matrix Y divided by threads per block Y. So there's nothing interesting I have done here other than I changed all my thread IDs to be 2D. And I'll come back to why CUDA allows you to group threads into blocks in a second. So this preset code right here, this is just regular C. Except CUDA, instead of, instead of like an ISPC where I call the function, I know it gets created for number of program instances. Here in CUDA, when I call the function, the program specifies how many instances get created. And the number of instances equals CUDA threads. So here I'm saying I want you to create this many blocks, and I want this many threads per block. And if you multiply six blocks times 12 threads per uh, 12 threads per block, that would be 72 CUDA threads or 72 program instances of this program. So very similar to ISPC, except this number is in your program, not set by the compiler. 
So does this make sense? Like here's a, another example of the syntax. So there is CPU code, host code, that looks exactly like C, except when it calls it to the function, it uses these special brackets. And then there's CUDA code, and a CUDA code has the word global in front of it. And this means it's CUDA code, and every CUDA function has access to thread index, which is what thread in the block this, this instance is. It has block index, which is what block this thread is. And in this particular case, I multiply what block I am times the size of the block. So this is kind of like program count to get the i and j for every thread. So in this case, every thread handles one element. And this is how I compute what element it needs to handle. A little bit more complicated with the uh, indexing, but nothing special. Good. OK, so we talked about that. Um, now, one thing I want to point out is now imagine that I change the size of my matrix to something smaller. So now I wanted to make a matrix that's 11 by 5. So my new code is matrix is 11 by 5. But I still, my code still creates red blocks of size. 12. And so the first thread block would be 4 by 3. The next thread block would be 4 by 3. Um, and then here, if you look at my math, I round it up. That is rounding up to the nearest block. So I create another thread block that is again. 4 by 3. So I should write parenthesis. 11 by 5. Then there would be another one here, here, here. Right? So this code says create this many threads. Every thread is responsible for one element. And so this thread here doesn't have anything to do. Oh, no, this one does. So we Sorry. Um, four by three, and then this should go to eleven, which should go right here. Yep. Okay. So just like in C code, you have to be careful not to run off the end of an array. This code here says that for some of the threads, they shouldn't do anything. Because the number of threads does not divide the size of the matrix. So I just wanted to be very clear that in CUDA programming, you create threads. And usually, you create exactly or about the same number of threads as there are elements in the array. But this is not a programming language where you say run matrix add for every element of the array. You say run matrix add this many times. And how you do the math in your code is how elements of the array are assigned to various threads. OK. So that was how the work or how threads get generated. Let me talk very quickly about how to think about memory. Because this is the first time you may have programmed a computer where there was a CPU and a GPU. And a CPU and a GPU have different memory. So there's memory on your CPU, there's memory for your GPU. So your C++ program can allocate variables. And they're stored in memory. Your CUDA program can allocate variables on the GPU. And they are stored in GPU memory. These are two different memories, two different address spaces. So if I want to allocate 
memory on the CPU. I could use malloc or in C++ new. This allocates memory on the CPU, and host A is a pointer to app memory on the CPU. CUDA malloc says I want to allocate memory on the GPU. And so device A is a pointer to memory on the GPU. And you have primitives, you have library functions like CUDA memcopy for moving data from buffers on the CPU to buffers on the GPU or back. Okay? So I want you to think about these things as two completely different memories. And it's not important right now, but I'll just say it so when you get to your homework, you're aware of it. Is there's actually several different types of memories on the GPU. There is GPU memory, which is exactly what I just said. Every thread can read and write <coughs> GPU memory. But then every thread block also has its own memory. So the reason why CUDA gen uh, groups threads into thread blocks is so all of the thread blocks and the, the threads in the same block can read and write to their own per block memory. And every thread also has its own private memory for local variables, just like any other thread. So there's variables that are shared across all threads. There are variables that are private to a single thread. And there are variables that are shared only between threads in one block. So there's three different types of, of, uh, of variables. Okay. So let's go to a very simple example. And this is an example that a lot of us in graphics are very interested in. It would be perform a convolution on an input array. Now, I'm lazy. I didn't want to draw a 2D convolution. I drew a 1D convolution. Um, um, a 2D convolution would be blurring an image. But I drew a 1D convolution. So the output at this element is the <coughs> average of the three surrounding elements. And the same for every single output. Very simple. Okay. So let's go ahead and write it in CUDA. So again, same draw. Every output element depends on three input elements. Okay. So here, let's look at the bottom first. This is the CPU code. And it should make a lot of sense. CUDA malloc, input array, CUDA malloc, output array. <coughs> Run my CUDA kernel. <laughs> evolve, and I'm going to choose, let's say, 128 threads per block. And we'll talk about that later. But right now, I just chose that randomly. And then the number of blocks I create is n divided by number of threads per block. Because n is the size of these arrays. So I have to compute n outputs. Every thread block will compute 128 outputs. And so I need to create n divided by 128 blocks of threads. Um, and let's assume that n divided by 128 is, is OK. All right. So then my program is pretty simple. It's every thread computes the index in the array that it's responsible for. So what block am I times the number of threads per block. This is block dimension or block size plus thread index in the block. So for block 0, thread 0, this will be 0 times 128 plus 0. 0 times 128 plus 1, and so on and so on. OK. So every thread just loads the right three values, adds them up, divides by 3, and stores the results into the output. So can everybody read this program? Does it make, make sense? It's basically C code with knowing that many of these programs are created at the same time. And if I replace ISPC program count and program index with thread index and thread and block index, you should be able to read this program. 
makes sense. Okay. So how many instructions are performed by one thread block? One thread block. So, so you should ask the question, how many instructions are performed by one thread? So one thread would be three loads, three multiply adds, one store. So every thread block will just multiply all of that by 128. So the processor will execute three loads, three multiplies, one store. I guess one divide. So now I'm going to show you why it makes sense to have a group of threads, a block of threads. So let me write a little bit fancier program that does the exact same thing in code. <clears throat> so this code right here is the exact same as this fancier code right here. Now notice the only difference is that I created a new variable. I called it support. In a convolution, sometimes you say that the pixels you need are the support region of the output. So my variable support. So all of the variables in this code are either upload, let me go back. So previous example, all the variables are either global variables and input output. Those are global variables. Or they are per thread local variables. For example, index is per thread. Result per thread. What I did in this new program is I created a per thread block variable. And you see that because it's shared float, not normal float. And a shared variable, there is one per thread block. So this is saying for every block, I want to allocate one variable shared. And so, how big is it? What are the, how many elements are in, in the shared variable? 130, right? 128 plus 2. So I created this shared variable. And there's one of those per thread block. So what does this code do? And I want, I want to see, so this is a good time to talk to your friend to see if without me telling you, can you tell me what this code in this red box does? And there's a big hint here, but I want you to talk about it first because the hint may not be good enough yet. So take 30 seconds and see if you can figure out what that code does. Why is there an if statement and so on and so on. So 30 seconds, talk about it.
for, and let's say, so this is, let's say this is alpha. If this thread block is responsible for this part of the output, and that would be starting at index. Thread zero grabs, so this is the input. Thread zero grabs this element and puts it here. And thread one grabs this element and puts it here. And we have 128 threads. So the 128th thread puts an element right here. So this is 127. So all of the threads in the thread block are working together to copy data from global memory into this shared memory. And of course, why is there an if statement here? There's an if statement because I need to load two more pieces of data. So I have two of the threads finish off the work, like load this here and this here. So it says if the thread index in the block is 0 or 1, load the last two elements of data. So now I have all 130 elements of data that I need to compute the 128 outputs. And then I just do the same computation, except I'm loading data from the shared memory rather than from the global variable. So now how many load instructions are there? Now it's not 3 times 128. It's actually 130 from global memory, which is much less than 3 times 128. So this is a good idea if this memory, shared memory, is much faster to, to access than the global memory. And so what CUDA will do is that CUDA guarantees that the shared memory is very fast. So some people like to think about shared memory as a cache. It's like right next to the chip, very much like a cache. But it's not quite a cache. It's as fast as a cache. But you as the programmer had to actually put data in it. You never actually have to put data in a cache. You just load and store and the machine <coughs> puts data in the cache. So shared memory is implemented as on-chip memory that's very fast. But it's not a cache because you get to put whatever you want in it. So in this case, I put 130 elements into that shared memory. And then I did the convolution where all the threads access that shared memory very fast. So I did far fewer load instructions from global memory. A few more details in the computation are that the sync threads is what CUDA's name for a barrier is. So sync threads says, wait until all threads have gotten here before starting to do this computation. And if I remove this sync threads, how, why would my program be wrong? Because this program runs by saying all threads in a block work together to load into shared memory. When everybody has done their part, after the barrier, is when, when the barrier finishes, we know everyone has done their part. Now all threads can just access the data. So it's like all the threads went out far away, grabbed the data, brought it close, and then everybody works on the data very close. Exactly. So you see a lot of things that you have already seen in the class. SPMD programming, barrier, and there are a few other useful things you can do in CUDA like atomic add and other things like that. So CUDA, quick summary of the language is it's just SPMD programming, except threads are now grouped into blocks. And the reason why we group threads into blocks is because for performance, it's very useful to give every block a very fast local memory. 
uh, so that they can run, so the block can run faster. ISPC has no concept of per gang local memory. Okay. So now that you know a little bit about how CUDA, how you describe CUDA programs, let's talk about how those CUDA programs are implemented on a GPU. Okay. So this is the same program. Let's assume now that n is really, really large. Let's say n is 1 million. And so my program creates one CUDA thread for every element in the array. That's how I wrote it. I, I create n over threads per block blocks, and every block has threads per block threads. So if I run this program, do you think we're going to create 1 million actual threads with 1 million copies of local variables or 1 and 8,000 copies of the local shared memory. So some people are shaking their head no. So what would you do instead? So if you're shaking your head no, you, you're, you have the right idea. Is that even though I call these CUDA threads, I don't want you thinking about them as I'm creating all of these threads and they're all running on the computer at once. Because I want to run this program. Well, I want to run it on a big, fancy, expensive GPU with 16 cores. And I want to run the same program on a small GPU with 6 cores. So I wouldn't want to create a million threads and have them all running roughly at the same time, even though I only had 6 cores. That doesn't make much sense. So what do you think CUDA is actually going to do? How would you implement this? How would you implement this? This is the same pattern we have seen many times in the class. I have a million pieces of work. I only have six workers. What am I going to do? I should just probably put all that work in a big list and hand them out dynamically to the workers, right? And that's exactly what's going to happen here. So let's think about this. So when I compile a CUDA program, not only is it going to compile into a sequence of instructions, it's also going to remember the requirements of the program. So this program needs 128 threads per block. That's what I asked for. It needs 130 floating point numbers of shared memory, which is 512 bytes, 130 times 4. And there's probably b bytes of local data per thread. So keep, remember those numbers. And now, we said that there are a million threads, or a million divided by 128 thread blocks. Those are the, that's the list I have up here. And in order to run a block, I need to be able to run 128 CUDA threads. And I need to be able to have 512 bytes of local memory. So, if I, so a GPU is now going to schedule all this work onto whatever cores it has. So let's think about how this will work. I'll jump past this one. So first of all, I have to tell you about how these GPU cores look like. This is a modern GPU core, using all the same colors as last time. So what you'll notice is that every core has 96 kilobytes of storage for shared memory. It's very much like an L1 cache, but it's not quite an L1 cache. This is the L1 cache. And every core has 64 execution contexts. We talked about this a little bit last week. So 64 hardware threads. And those threads run 32 wide SIMD instructions. So for every fetch and decode up here, I have 32 yellow boxes. So this core can run four instructions from four different wars. 
on one of its four sets of ALUs. So interleave multi-threading because it chooses four of 64. Simultaneous multi-threading because it actually runs four different threads at once. And in the diagram I had before, I had a grayed out second fetch and decode unit. Some people ask me about that. But there's actually eight fetch and decode units because for any one thread, it can run superscalar as long as one of the instructions uses the ALUs and the other instruction uses some other execution units like maybe load or store units. So here I actually colored those green for a different reason. So it picks four threads, runs 32 wide SIMD instructions, and sometimes can run two instructions from that thread if one happens to be map and another happens to be some other special stuff like load, store, or some other. So this slide summarizes what I just said, is that shared memory is stored here. So my 520 bytes of shared memory go here. My 128 threads per thread block, well, 32 of those threads get mapped to a single SIMD instruction, just like an entire gang in, in ISPC gets mapped to a single vector in, uh, instru SIMD instruction. In CUDA, if you have 128 threads, that requires four of these execution contexts. So my program here with 128 threads will get compiled into four instruction streams, each of which are executing 32 wide SIMD instructions. So in CUDA, thread ID 0, 1, 2, 3, all the way to 31, all goes into the same execution context and all shares an instruction. 32 through 63, another execution context, another instruction. So the requirements of this program are 512 bytes of shared memory and four execution contexts. That's 32 times 4 equals 128. And you'll hear in, 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 in NVIDIA calls an execution context a warp. And they call it warp because if, you are, uh, if you know about making uh, rugs, it's actually like the warp threads in, uh, in making uh, in making fabric. <clears throat> so what is a warp? A warp is the implementation detail. On modern CUDA hardware, 32 CUDA threads are executed by one warp. One warp executes 32 wide vector instructions. So this is all very much like last week. I'm just kind of giving new names and new numbers. So let's think about how this all works together. So I made a new core. I made a much a simple fake one for an example. My new core can only execute one thread per clock and can execute one SIMD instruction. And it has room for uh, 60... <coughs> 12 warps. 12 times 32 is 384 CUDA threads. But let's say this core has room for 12 warps, 12, 12 for hardware threads, 12 execution contents, 32 wide 70, but only one instruction per clock. So it's a, it's a fake, fake GPU. Okay. So let's talk about, uh, so this was a real GPU, and I'll skip that because I want to finish. Let's talk about running this. So if I was to run this program, let's say I have two cores, again, fake cores, one instruction per clock, 32 wide, 70, 12 warps, 12 hardware threads. And I have millions of things to do, many things to do. So the GPU gets the command, run this kernel, this function, with these arguments, and I want you to run 1,000 blocks. So the kernel is just going to, sorry, the, the GPU is just going to start dynamically assigning thread blocks to cores, like this. So the first thing that will happen will say, okay, let's work on the first one. 
let's assign the first red block to, uh, to core 0. And so notice that we reserved 512 bytes of shared memory. And notice that we reserved four warps, or 128 CUDA threads of context. Well, the machine is not full. So let's keep going. Let's go ahead and assign the second thread block to the other core. So now each core is running one thread block. But we can keep going. There's more room. Let's assign the third thread block to this core. Notice that I took another 512 bytes of storage. And I grabbed another 128 threads worth of execution context. Another four warps. Same thing over here. Now, can the GPU assign the fourth block to any of its cores? Yes or no? So we have room here because we have, uh, we have enough execution context, but we actually don't have enough shared memory. We only had uh, 1.5 kilobytes. We're already using a little bit more than 1K. We cannot assign the core, the, the, the thread block to this core because we are out of shared memory. Because you wrote your code assuming that you had very fast shared memory. So assignment stops. Cores, cores are running these thread blocks. At some point, one of those blocks finishes. And now the scheduler can put block four into that, onto that core. Maybe another one finishes. Schedule or puts a new one on there, and so on and so on. So, GPUs schedule thread blocks. It will only, a GPU will only schedule a thread block onto a core if the resources are available. Execution context resources, shared memory resources. And it just does this with a dynamic schedule. And notice that all the threads in the same thread block go to the same core, because that means the shared memory is right next to all the threads, and is really fast. And that's basically how a GPU runs a CUDA program. So you know how a CPU runs an ISPC program. You now know <coughs> how a, uh, a GPU runs a CUDA program. And I think that we should stop, but I want to ask you one question to see, see if you understand. Here's one question, and it's a little bit trickier. So imagine that we have this fake GPU core. Only has four warps, so four big execution contexts, which means that it can only have support for 32, uh, no, sorry, 128 threads at once. And then I'm going to run the program that I told you about in this class. It is a thread block with 128, no, sorry, I changed it now, to 256 threads. So it needs eight warps. And notice that, remember, it, it, all the threads load some data. All the threads wait until all threads are here. And then it continues. So here's my question. Do you think I can run this program? on this GPU core. This program asks for 256 threads, eight warps. The GPU only has four warps. Why don't I just run the first 60, uh, 128 threads until they complete, and then I run the next 128 threads? Do you think that is a solution to this problem or not? Because before, remember I had 1,000 blocks. So I ran the first two blocks, and then I ran more blocks, and when one block finished, I ran more blocks. Why don't I just do that here with threads inside a block? Why not run 128 threads until they completely finish, and then I'll put the next 128 threads on this core? Does anybody see a problem? And the problem is right here. 
Exactly. So what do you think is going to happen? So I'm going to run the first 128 threads. They will load their data. They will get to the barrier. What will they do? They will wait till the other 128 threads also get here. But why will the other 128 threads never get here? Because they're never actually ever run. Because the first 128 threads are taking the process. This program stops right there and never finishes. So a GPU will never assign a thread block to a processor unless the thread resources are available and the shared memory resources are available. The only option to run this program correctly would have been somehow to take all of the threads off the core, put new threads on, and then put them all back, very much like an operating system on a CPU. GPUs don't do that for you. So we will call it, you know, like in, in the terminology would be preemption. Once a thread is running on a GPU, it never leaves until it's done. Okay, I'll stop there. Today was a very long day, but tomorrow will be a much shorter day.
。就不要不要抄就好了，就你们可以讨论讨论完之后，你们去呃自己再把正确答案写一遍，再交给正确的，然后就不要。然后这这这两个没没有人。怕大家挂掉，然后再交一些。呃，对啊，对啊。昨天我们老师。对，我发现。嗯。对对对对。啊，他有时候是直接做一个，完全去扣。啊。Program, 我写了两个。你也做完了？不是，我不问你那个。不是，我问你那个。